Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Leaders Credit Union. Thank you, Alexis, and welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Alexis, before I introduce today's very special guests, what's something you've discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? Well, I've actually been looking into the membership perks, um, and if you're not a member, then you would know this, but Discovery Park membership actually offers admissions to museums across the U.S., um, and that's through the ASTC program. That is a fact, and there's another program, too, that we also offer tickets to. So, I mean, when you travel, you could get free admission to multiple other uh, museums, and I actually talked to the Crossons, were in town a couple, couple it was past weekend maybe, yeah. um, and they told me they'd been using theirs oh, all over the place, so they've been really cashing in on their yeah, some good Discovery choices. Park. They have a lifetime membership, oh, so they've been cashing in on that. Perks. So we have two special guests today. Uh, both are involved in an organization called Young Life, which we're going to hear more about for those of you who aren't familiar with Young Life. Chase Treese is a youth pastor for Crosswind and North West Tennessee Young Life Staff Associate for Union City, and Morgan Goodman is the Northwest Tennessee Young Life Staff Associate for Martin. We're going to kick things off with Chase. Welcome, Chase. Yeah, Scott. Uh, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, super excited to do this today. So back us all the way up. Tell us uh, where Chase was born. Uh, how'd you grow up? All the all the details behind your childhood. Yeah, so I was born here in Union City, uh, lived here my whole life, um, you know, grew up just like any other kid here in Union City. Went to, I was actually the last class of kids to ever be in East Side Elementary School. So when I was in kindergarten was the last year it was open uh, and then moved over um, from there and, you know, grew up normal childhood. Uh, you know, my dad. Grew up taking me hunting and fishing all the time because that's what he loved to do. And, uh, you know, just good old Union City boy, I guess. Now, for people who aren't from around here, as yeah. they say, uh, what hunting and fishing, you know, can take on different meetings in different parts <laughs> yeah. of the country. You for know, sure. what did that mean to you and your dad and, and uh, your family? Yeah, so uh, we really grew up predominantly going to Real Foot Lake. Uh, my dad, he's got a private blind out there. And so. Um, we've got to duck hunt out there. That's really what I grew up doing a lot was a lot of duck hunting. And, um, that's just what he's super passionate about. My dad was a, he's a contest caller and he's made some duck calls and designed some duck calls for, um, some different call companies and stuff like that. And so, uh, that's just what he was passionate about. So we grew up duck hunting a lot, a lot of bass fishing, a lot of bluegill fishing. Um, and really all of that was happening on real foot lake, honestly. Uh, that's kind of, where my outdoor roots run is there. Uh, I love the story of the lake and how it was formed and all that stuff. And so that's, uh, you know, for us, it was a lot of duck hunting, a lot of fish, a lot of bass fishing. Now, uh, I really love to turkey hunt, deer hunt a lot. Uh, kind of got into that as I got older, just with some friends and buddies. But um, yeah, so it looks like for me. So I, I know that the uh, different uh, duck blinds on Real Foot Lake there's a huge history behind how how people um, have them in their families, yeah. and talk a little bit about that. I don't know that we've ever talked about that on the podcast. Uh, yeah. but it's very interesting. Yeah. So uh, for a long time, uh, you know, you could just go on Real Foot Lake and build a blind if you wanted to, and you had to register it with the state um, and all that stuff. And as long as you kept the registration up. Um, you know, you got to keep it in your name and got to keep your spot. And so it wasn't really like you owned a portion of the lake, it's just that one really GPS location, you could have it. And then I believe it was late eighties, sometime in the late eighties, um, the state came in and, uh, you know, used to, you could buy and sell and lease and trade and all that stuff, the duck blinds. And 
uh, in the late 80s, the state decided that they wanted to make it a little more fair for the general public to be out there. And so they started implementing draw blinds, uh, which is basically at the beginning of every duck season, you can put your name into a big pot. They draw your name out. And if you're the first one, you get the first pick of the draw. If you're the last one, you get the last pick, whatever's left. Uh, but all the people that had private blinds got grandfathered in. And so um, if you had a private blind in your name, you got to keep that spot in that location, uh, but you, could, you couldn't pass it down anymore. So like, um, you know, if your granddad had a blind, he couldn't pass it down to you in his will or anything like that. Whenever people pass away, then the state takes over ownership of it and it goes into the draw pot. So, so are you the, it, it will go to you or I, I wish you, I wish uh, gotcha. so no, when your dad passes away it ends. Right, that's, yeah that's it so um you know whenever um we we actually it's not actually in my dad's name uh we hunt with a guy um and he um, is the one that owns it and so whenever he passes away that's going to be the end of it but my dad's hunted in that same spot for the last 30 years. Um, and so that's where I grew up hunting. It's on the Grace Camp side of the lake. So on the north end of the lake, and, uh, right by the refuge. And, uh, you know, I've been blessed to shoot a lot of ducks and eat a lot of good meals and, uh, you know, make a lot of really good memories out there in that blind. And so, but yeah, whenever uh, the man that owns it passes away, it'll go over to the state and we just got to hope to get lucky like everybody else, I guess. I was going to ask you, you mentioned the meals. So does the duck blind that you guys have, is it one of those fancy one that has like a stove and a refrigerator and you can actually cook a breakfast in there? Oh, oh yeah. We, uh, we're definitely not roughing it by any means. Uh, you know, we've got, we've got a couple of recliners and a full size stove and heaters and, you know, all that stuff out there. We're, we're definitely, uh, on the luxury end of duck blinds for sure. Uh, yeah, that's, that's some of my favorite memories, just sitting down there and cooking breakfast with my dad and eating some biscuits and, you know, kicking back and relaxing. Well, I know that that's really what distinguishes a real Foot Lake-style duck hunt from uh, folks like down in Arkansas or um, up at the top of the Mississippi Flyway. Yeah. We've been doing a lot of research on duck hunting and, and the various yeah. styles. And it's fascinating to me that such a unique culture is right here, you know, 20 minutes away from Discovery Park. Yeah, you know, it's funny too, because growing up here and doing it all the time, it's like not really that big of a deal to me. Uh, you know, roof at Lake, the, it's kind of smelly, the mud stinks. And like, you know, that's, that's how I picture it in my mind. But when I was in college, um, I used to guide duck hunting a little bit. And there would be people coming from, michigan and georgia and florida and north carolina and uh they didn't even care to kill ducks they just wanted to see real foot lake and i i didn't i never really appreciated it i guess growing up um because i didn't you know it was just real foot lake a bunch of old dead trees and stumps and that's kind of what i thought about it and as i've gotten older and the more i've looked into the history of it and um you know just the deep roots of the community around the area and how it was formed and all that stuff uh, you know i i get the draw and um, you know, just blessed to have been, been able to hunt on it and fish on it my whole life. Yeah, it's there's an airport uh, here in Union City, and from what I hear, when duck season opens, a lot of uh, folks fly their planes in, or, oh, yeah. you know, we'll have entertainers, music, uh, celebrities, and the like will fly in, and a, a, a hunter, a guide oh, yeah. will pick them up and take them um, yeah. Hunting, so yeah i mean even the hotels and things like that around here i mean they just get it's hard to find a hotel room sometimes during duck season just because you know everybody's trying to stay somewhere and union city's not too far away and um gets pretty booked up right around the lake because that's everybody wants to stay on the lake if they can and, but it, it really is a big industry driver around here during duck season the guide services um people coming in i mean it's only 60 days of the year but uh, you know, it's a, that's a huge uh, economic boost for a lot of people around here. So, so take us back. You graduated from high school. Uh, yeah. Did you have any kind of uh, internal battle over where to go or what to major in? How did you come? How did you decide what to do next? Yeah. So uh, I graduated high school and like anybody else, I guess, wanted to make a little bit of money. And so I was trying to figure out how can I make the most money? Uh, and so when I went into college, I actually uh, was an engineering major when I first got, I went to college at UTM. Um, and so 
uh, when I first got there, I went into the engineering program and, um, you know, I like math and thought it, I'd make some money doing it. And so did that for about a year. Um, and, you know, I pulled the college freshman life of nobody made me go to class anymore. And so I didn't go to a lot of classes a lot of times. And so um, I, uh, I ended up actually taking a year off from school uh, and came back. And during that year, um, I actually got an internship at a church over in South Fulton um, and South Fulton, Tennessee. And um, the youth pastor there took me under his wing and uh, just kind of let me shadow him and see what that life was kind of like. And I'd been wrestling with uh, a call to the ministry for a while. And, um, but it wasn't something, you know, nobody goes into ministry for the money. And so, uh, you know, in my mind, that's, that's what I was chasing and just doing that for a year and uh, coming back to school. So now I, I got a business management degree uh, just because I felt like, you know, that was something that'd give me a good uh, fallback if I needed it, but also just give me a good scope of, uh, you know, what it looks like to, to kind of manage budgets and stuff like that, which you're going to do in the church world a lot. So uh, really that, that opened the door for me into uh, what it would look like to, to be in ministry. And so uh, my sophomore year of college, I guess, is when I really started diving into ministry life. And, and at the time really, you know, I just thought the only ministry opportunity was at a church. Um, you know, I didn't, I knew that young life existed, but I didn't really think about young life staff at the time. I just thought, okay, I'm young. I like to hang out with kids. I'll, I'll do youth ministry just because that's what makes sense. And so, um, but really as I worked is when, uh, I felt like my calling kind of started to form and really stepped into who I guess God was really wanting me to be and want me to do. Yeah. So my dad is a minister okay, and he felt called into the ministry, as we say in the Baptist yeah, right. denomination, uh, while he was walking down a path to go and feed the horses that we had. Yeah. And so then after that, anytime I had to go feed the horses, I would run really, really fast and <laughs> hide my head so that hopefully, you know, I could dodge any kind of uh, similar callings. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, God never, God called me to work at Discovery Park of America. So yeah, I love that. Yeah. So, um, so you uh, started uh, going down that path. What what was your family, other people, your friends' responses to that? Were they all supportive? Yeah, I I mean, I think for I think some people, you know, a lot of people that knew me in high school probably wouldn't have thought that I would go into the ministry just because I just was not, uh, you know, I was not that person in high school. You know, I was. Um, you know, I like to go out and be with my friends on the weekends and do what everybody else is doing. And, um, you know, really for me, it was after kind of maybe the end of my senior year of high school into college when I really started um, to get serious about my walk with the Lord. And um, but, you know, once once I started talking to people about it, um, you know, they kind of saw the change that was happening in me. I, I had support for everybody that that was around me and close to me. Um, you know, nobody, nobody pushed back. They wanted what was best for me and, um, could see that I was passionate about it and that it was, you know, something I truly felt called to do. And it wasn't just something I was doing on a whim because it sounded fun, but, um, something that God was really drawing me into. Yeah, that's great. So, yeah. um, for folks who don't, um, who maybe are different denominations or, or don't know anything at all about the pathway of, of ministry, for sure. uh, what was your major and, you know, did, did you go to seminary or anything like that? Yeah. So, uh, I'm a business management major. Um, uh, so nothing fancy, uh, you know, almost just for me really honestly was just to kind of get through school. Um, you know, I felt like I needed a degree to kind of, um, you know, we'll look good on a resume and for people to take me a little bit serious. Uh, so I did that. Um, I, I haven't gone to seminary. don't know if I will go to seminary or not. I'm just not a big, not don't really love school all that much. Um, so yeah, I, I didn't do seminary, anything like that. So no real, I guess you call it formal training, but, uh, you know, I've been, I've been working in the ministry since I was 19 now. So seven, almost eight years. Um, and, uh, so I've just got a lot of experience with um, high school kids and middle school kids and, uh, you know, kind of learning on the fly as I was doing it and growing in my walk with the Lord. And, you know, that's the biggest thing for me and all of it really is um, just kind of the push for me to to grow spiritually, because I feel like if I'm going to lead other people in that, that I have to, you know, be be confident in my own relationship with, 
with Jesus first. And so, um, you know, that, that's where, uh, my growth has been. So, yeah, I never, never really got any official schooling for that. Um, but you know, just, I've got a lot of really good mentors and a lot of people who push me and challenge me and, um, have taught me a lot of the things that I know. And I should, I should know a lot more about young life than I do. My kids were in young life. I dropped them off, you know, at different churches and ski yeah. trips and, you know, and so I, you know, I know enough to know that it serves a really important need yeah. as much of the hit. Cause we love history here at discovery Report. as much of the history of young life that you, that you know, could you share that? And then also sort of what is young life? Yeah. I probably don't know as much of the history as I should, um, but I do know uh, Young Life started in 1941 um, in Tyler, Texas. Hey, that's uh, already more than I knew. So you're yeah. <laughs> you're on the right track. Yeah, so it was Tyler, Texas, and it was just a group of parents that uh, were just praying for kids in their community. Um, you know, they saw a need for kids who uh, maybe didn't have a church home or didn't have families who who uh, were pushing them uh, towards the cross, and so. Uh, they just kind of started a prayer group and it really just exploded out of that. And so uh, that's one of the big things in young life is it started with prayer and we want to keep praying. And, uh, you know, that's one of the reasons we really believe that it's grown into, you know, now there's young life all over the world. It's over a hundred countries across the world have young life in it now. And it all started from just a group of people who are willing to, to sit and pray and ask God uh, in Tyler, Texas, so 1941. And so, uh, you know, it's been really cool to be a part of that. Uh, a little bit of history here, I guess, uh, in our community, uh, late 70s, early 80s, um, there was uh, Young Life in Jackson, Tennessee, has been around for like 50 years now. Um, and so late 70s, early 80s, there were some people from Jackson uh, who came up to this area and wanted to bring Young Life with them and um, so there was Young Life in at UTM for for a little while, and uh, Mar- Westview High School had Young Life back in the late seventies, early eighties. I know Dyersburg, Tennessee, also had it for a while back then, um, and it just you know wasn't anybody's fault or any real reason. Um, you know, just kind of fell apart back then and went away. Um, and then two thousand eleven or twelve. Uh, there was a group of parents here in Union City uh, who remembered Young Life from then uh, and, uh, you know, knew about Young Life. And there's a mom who had experienced Young Life in Collierville, Tennessee, and her kids were about to be coming through high school. And just like, hey, this is something that, um, you know, is just another thing for my kid to have a positive influence in their life. Let, let's get this back going. And so uh, really the first um, official start for Young Life in Union City um, was in 2013. And so we actually just had our banquet celebrated 10 years of Young Life ministry here in Union City. Um, and so we're super excited about that. And I'm glad to be a part of it now. Uh, and, and really what we do, um, you know, we, we do a lot of fun stuff. You know, we go on the trips and we go camping and we um, do hikes and uh, you know, we play silly games and sing songs and, uh, you know, we did, we did a game called bigger and better the other week and, uh, everybody gets a paper clip at the beginning. We call it club. That's what we call our meetings. Um, and so everybody got a paper clip and they got to go out in their cars and you get an hour, you slowly trade up, bring back the biggest and best thing. Somebody brought back some live ducks. Somebody brought back some chips and queso and just other, you know, fun stuff like that. And I think that's what a lot of people think young life is and, but really why we do those things is just because that's simply a way for us to let kids feel safe, uh, let kids feel like they can be themselves and they kind of drop their guard a little bit when they have some laughs and uh, just to know that, um, you know, they can be who they are and they're still going to be loved. And, and really what that does for us is just open a door for us to, to share the gospel and to tell them about who Jesus is and how much he loves them and, and really all that stems from our relationship with Jesus and how much he loves us. And so, so here's the, because your finger is clearly on the pulse of young people today. Let, yeah. let me ask you a few questions that I, as a person of, of, of uh, I, my wife and I are parents of daughters that have become young adults and they've flown the coop and we're empty nesters and we don't have grandchildren yet. So we're in that in between phase. Um, what, what do you think are the biggest challenges facing 
uh, young folks today that are in the, the demographic age <laughs> that you're working with? Yeah, so we have, I, I'm, I work with primarily six to 12th grade kids. Um, and I, I really think, you know, I, I feel like I graduated high school really recently, but in reality, it was 10 years ago now. And so uh, even, even though that's not a super long time, so much has changed uh, from then to now in the life of high school kids. And, and I really think the biggest challenge for them is just the exposure that they have uh, to the world and the world has to them. Uh, you know, everything that they do is either posted on Snapchat or TikTok or Instagram, or if it's not, then they're seeing somebody else who posted that. And there's just a lot of pressure on them to always be doing something or always be, you know, wearing the right thing, saying the right thing, hanging out with the right people, um, you know, whatever it is. And, uh, you know, they just, we, we, we just had our, our train, our new staff training not that long ago. And, uh, they had, they had a, somebody with a lot more education than I have. And, uh, they, she was just talking about, uh, this generation, how this is like the first global generation is what she called it. And, um, you know, that there's, there's kids in high school right now who they have more in common with a kid their age that's in Australia than they do with their neighbor right next to him. Who's a baby boomer. Uh, it's just because of the access that they have that they can, see the same things and listen to the same artists and watch the same videos and, um, you know, eat the same foods and they can just have so much access. And so I think really, I guess all that to say the real challenge uh, for high school kids is just figuring out who they want to be because there's so much access to all these different ideas and, uh, you know, social pressures and, uh, political views and religious views, and they can just see everything at the click of a button. And so uh, it's just hard for them to kind of make sense of everything in the world all at once because they have it all right in front of them. And so, um, yeah, I think the biggest challenge is just figuring out what's true and what's right and what's real. And so for any suggestions for those that are listening that are parents or grandparents of of young people today, how can, how can those who are listening contribute in a positive way to the lives of their young people? Yeah, I, I think the biggest thing is just uh, being honest and, and being truthful um, and, and showing grace. Uh, you know, I think it's easy. It's easy for us and, and me included um, to look at, at kids now and just think what in the world is going on and how do we go wrong? And oh, my gosh, they're so horrible. And just to really kind of make them feel ashamed a little bit. And and in reality, if we're if we're all really honest, there was a point in our life where we were doing the same things and having the same thoughts. It just wasn't posted all over social media for people to see. And so I think just having grace and and loving them and um, making sure that they know that, Hey, even though you're doing this and, and maybe I don't agree with it completely uh, that I still love you and I still want what's best for you. And, and I think in all that too, is uh, being up to speed on what they, what they have access to. I think it's easy to just like, push it off and say, I don't want to learn about that. I don't care about technology. Like I don't, you know, that's not for me, but if you're not informed on what they have access to, it's going to be impossible for you to, to really have a conversation about it or have any kind of influence that they really care about. Cause they're just going to think that you don't know what you're talking about. And you probably don't to be honest about it. Um, and so I think, I think just that, and, and just being real, you know, kids, kids now, they can just spot fakeness from a mile away. Uh, people who aren't honest, people who aren't really being themselves and who don't really care about them the way that they say they care about them. They can see that from so far and they're not going to want anything to do with it. So you can just be honest with about who you are and what you've done. It's going to, it's going to give you a lot more um, weight in their life of um, how they listen to you and what they care about what you're saying. So last question, I'm speaking yep. at uh, UT Martin's career day tomorrow. Yeah. You were a UT Martin student a decade ago. So t- yeah. t- tell me, what advice do you wish you had heard that would have meant something to you when you were a college student, if you had applied it? Okay, yeah. Uh, if, you, if you were like me, when you were a college student, you could have heard a lot of advice and just sure. completely ignored it. So for sure. um, is there anything in particular that you think, man, I wish somebody had told me that in college? 
Yeah. Uh, I, I think one thing is that um, how other people see you and how other people think of you doesn't matter as much as you think it does. Um, and, and the truth is the, the only thing that really matters is, uh, you know, that the God of the universe, Jesus came down and like what he says about you is the truth that he loves you, that you're his son or you're his daughter. Uh, you know, Jesus calls us his friends. Um, like that is what matters. And I think I spent a lot of time trying to make other people happy, whether it was, you know, trying to be an engineering major because people told me I should make money or it was the parties that I went to, or it was uh, the people I hung out with or the stuff that I wore or the things that I said, like, I was just, I was just trying to make other people happy. And at the end of the day, if, if I could have really applied it and understood it and believed it as much as I believe it now, that the only thing that matters is that Jesus loves me and that Jesus knows me and he, and he still cares about me. Um, then then that's what I would apply. And it would have made my life a whole lot easier then. Uh, just because that takes a lot of pressure off. You know, I think we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to to please the world and to please people. And, um, you know, people are impossible to please. They always want something more. Uh, and and all that Jesus wants is you for who you are, where you're at right now in this moment. And and that's that's easy to do if we if we let it happen. And and really that's kind of what we do in young life is that's what we're telling kids is you know, a lot of people, especially, and, you know, we live in rural West Tennessee, there's a church on every single corner. So if you go up to anybody in our town, they're going to tell you, even if you ask them if they're a Christian, their answer is probably going to be, well, I go to church wherever I go to church, you know, uh, you know, whether that's first, you know, Methodist, first Baptist, I go to Crosswind, I go to second Baptist, I go to Cumberland Presbyterian church, whatever. Uh, that's what they're going to say. Uh, but they don't really understand what, relationship with Jesus really looks like. And, you know, that's what we're trying to show kids in young life is that life with Jesus is not all about rules and regulations and um, that you have to sit upright, wear the same right shirt and say the right things and do these rituals. Like Jesus wants you for who you are right now in this moment. Um, And, you know, that that's kind of my, what, what drew me to young life was that, you know, there wasn't an expectation for me to change who I was. I didn't have to, you know, sit silently in the back and sit up straight and, um, you know, feel like I had to change who I was. Like Jesus wants me for me. He died for me because not because he wa- he expected me to be better, but because he knew I wasn't good enough. So he had to die for me. Um, and so that's all that we're trying to show kids and show them that life with Jesus can be a lot of fun and that you can, um, be who you are and still be loved by the King and, uh, and love other people in that too. Excellent advice for both young people and old people like me. Thank you for joining us, Chase. When we return from the break, we're going to spend some time with Morgan Goodman, the Northwest Tennessee Young Life Staff Associate for Martin. With nine branches in West Tennessee and nationwide ATM and branch access, you can take leaders with you wherever you go. From checking accounts, credit cards, home loans, and their state-of-the-art mobile app, Banking with Leaders can help you move forward. Learn more and see how you can qualify for membership at leaderscu.com. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. This is your host, Scott Williams, and our next guest on our special Young Life episode is Morgan Goodman, the Northwest Tennessee Young Life Staff Associate for Martin. Welcome, Morgan. Hello. So... I know that uh, you are good friends with a lot of folks that work here at Discovery Park of America, but you and I have not gotten to hang yet, so um, we don't know each other. I know you said you, uh, I I know earlier we talked about you used to work at Lowe's, so um, I might have encountered you at Lowe's uh, because Lord knows I've been in there and spent enough money um, at Lowe's, so um, that's very interesting. But back us up a little bit and tell us uh, uh, where do you come from? What, What where, where were you born? What was your childhood like? That kind of thing. Yeah. So, um, I grew up in, uh, East Tennessee, 
Uh, it's a little town called Cleveland. It's about, I don't know, maybe 20 miles north of Chattanooga. And uh, just grew up in a very East Tennessee life, I guess, lifestyle. Um, you know, have it been really, I loved East Tennessee because you had all the mountains and the, the kind of like wildlife and adventure side of, of Tennessee, but you're also really close to, you know, the cities like Chattanooga or uh, Nashville, Atlanta, definitely Knoxville, you know, go Vols. Um, and then real close to North Carolina too. And so um, just had a lot of fun growing up, um, a lot of fun in that that part of the uh, the state. And then I came over to West Tennessee my first time uh, when I went to Union for about two years. And um, that was the first time I realized that uh, that Tennessee, there's parts of Tennessee that don't have mountains and there's parts of Tennessee that's flat. Um, I grew right, up. Well, that's what I was going to say when, you know, when you said you grew up in East Tennessee, that's almost as different as if you grew up in Iowa or right. uh, California. I mean, the, the Tennessee is such a varied state. A lot of people don't realize that. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, <clears throat> it was interesting because I never realized, I mean, you know, the mountain, some people say Tennessee's mountains aren't real compared to like, you know, the Rockies and stuff. But, but I mean, everywhere in East Tennessee, everywhere you look, there's, you feel like you're in a bowl, like there's some kind of um, range around you. And so when I came to West Tennessee and it was all flat, it, it did feel like I was in another state. Um, and so uh, I went to Union um, for, for a couple of years and then ended up transferring to, to UTM. And um, that was just an awesome, awesome experience. I, I loved Union, but um, I really feel like coming to UTM was was it just a huge part of of the change in trajectory tra trajectory goodness uh, for the rest of my life and so it's uh, it's been a real gift being part of being a part of this side of the state so so when you when you were uh, in high school and trying to decide uh, what to do with your life what ma to major in um, what, what were your what were your parents doing what were their jobs. So my dad, he is a mechanical engineer. Um, he, he spent most of his career working for Whirlpool. Um, just a really smart guy, really, really capable of doing pretty much anything. Grew up from a family that didn't have much, and so he was really determined to, uh, to make, make his way, I guess, if that makes sense. Um, and then my mom, she was a dental hygienist. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, they're, they're both really smart and uh, my older brothers, they um, they are both scientists right now. One of them mm -hmm. is a chemist, and one of them is a, a wildlife biologist. He does something with uh, the water in East Tennessee. But yeah, so <clears throat> that's what my my family kind of got into. But I kind of knew that I wasn't really smart enough to uh, to do most of those things. Um, and I kind of felt like um, God was was kind of you know a big part of my life. Growing up in church and growing up. Um, just with a great family, great household um, that really loved the Lord. And um, that was that was the biggest thing for me um, as far as trying to figure out where I wanted to go. And um, I really wanted to go to Knoxville. Honestly, I wanted to go to UT and be a ball. But um, I toured it twice. And both times, I just felt like it wasn't wasn't for me. And then I toured Union the first time. And as soon as I stepped uh, stepped on the ground, I was like, wow, this is it. My dad was like, really? And I was like, yep. And so that was that was kind of that for me. That's great. Yeah. Um, so you only did you only tour two colleges, or did you have other colleges you toured? Um, I toured quite a bit. Um, Carson Newman, you know, Lee University, if you know where that's that's right in Cleveland, and then Knoxville mm -hmm. and uh, Chattanooga, MTSU. So you were uh, you were staying in Tennessee, is that right? You no, know, I I didn't really want to. Um, I thought about going to Liberty in Virginia, like. I feel like half of America does. Um, everybody talks about there. And um, I thought about, I really, I really wanted to go um, outside of the state, but just because of the, how expensive it got, I was just like, well, might as well just stay in state and, and find somewhere there. So um, I toured a Lincoln Memorial. I'm trying to think where else I went. Um, so I, I toured a lot in the state of Tennessee. Um and then uh, ATSU is another one. Um, but, yeah, I just really, really found home in, in West Tennessee. And what did you know uh, immediately what your major was going to be, or, or how would you start out? Um, I didn't. I I think I changed it probably four or five times when I was still at Union. Um, when I came to UTM, I kind of said it and just didn't change it. But 
I started off as like a, a minist- pastoral ministries major with a minor in something, I don't even remember. And then I changed to a business major and then a ministries minor. And then I changed to a double major of international business and then a French major. Um, and that was what I st- stuck with until um, I uh, until I transferred to UTM. And what did you switch to? So when I was at UTM, I was a, a finance major and then a, a management minor. Okay, great. And that's what you graduated with? Mm-hmm. Yep. Excellent. And and in, I'm assuming, but I don't want to assume that you got involved in Young Life when you were going to UT Martin. So um, it was actually a really, really wild story. Um, I I didn't know what Young Life was at all growing up. Um, I, I found out what it was whenever I'm – um, my brother, actually, he was living with someone, his roommate um, at Lee University. He was a Young Life leader in Cleveland, and he invited me to go to Young Life camp my senior year. It was right after I graduated. They were trying to get it going and where I was living, and, and I really didn't want to go. I told him no. I was like, I'm not really about this. And then he went and talked to my mom, uh, as a good Young Life leader would. And so she, <laughs> she was like, well, you should, you should go. You should try it. Because like the people who were going to go, they already paid for it and dropped out. So it was a free spot. And I was like, okay, whatever. So I get there the first you know, few days, and um, I was kind of confused because it wasn't church camp. And I'd grown up going to church camp. Um, and it got to about the third day, and I was really just like, I didn't really understand it. Um, and then that's when my leader pulled me aside, and, and he just pulled back the curtain as far as what Young Life was, and it blew me away. He was pointing out all of these intentional relationships that were happening, how every part of camp was just centered around the gospel, and it just really blew me away. But I was like, that's cool, but, you know, that's, that's probably it for me. I probably won't get involved with that anymore. And, and when, I, when I went to orientation at Union, I, was hap- I just happened to be wearing that shirt that I got from that camp. And, and Young Life's pretty big in Jackson and at Union, and so one of – one of my friends who, or one of, I guess he was, he's my friend now, but he wasn't then. He saw it and invited me to, to Young Life Leader Training. And so I kind of got involved with it um, in Union, but I was I was honestly a pretty bad Young Life Leader. I was doing so many other things at Union that I didn't really give a lot of myself to it. And um, and so I when I transferred, um, I called the area director in Jackson and was like, hey, man, I'm I'm about to leave Union. Um, I don't know where I'm going to go, but I just want to let you know, like, I'm, I'm going to have to to part ways with Young Life again. And I uh, just, you know, I was kind of thanking him for all that because he had really pulled me aside and, and was kind of like a, a really good mentor and leader to me. Um, and so, I w- again, then I was like, all right, this now, now this this chapter of my life for Young Life is really close. You know, first time I saw it and I was like, okay, okay. And then when I got to UTM, the first week I was there, um, Somebody was like, hey, did, did you say you did Young Life? I was like, yeah. Um, some guy that I met, and he was like, do you know uh, Ross Barnes? I was like, yeah, he's the air director in, in Jackson. He's the guy that, you know, he's he's like one of my best friends. And he was like, well, he moved to uh, Union City to start Young Life. And I was like, no way. Um, and so I run to my car to call him because we were playing Old <laughs> Crazy or something. And he, uh, he had just called me like 10 minutes before because he had found out that I was in in Martin. And so from there, we kind of were like, all right, let's, uh, let's pioneer this. And so that was really when I got involved with the young life or the Martin side of, of young life in West Tennessee. And so, so for, so for, um, I know, uh, Chase and I talked a little bit about the history of young life, but Chase was not much of a historian to be honest with you. Yeah. So uh, he was great in a lot of areas, but he fell short on the history <laughs> of young life. So do you have do you have any more uh, truth you can lay on us about the history of young life? Um. Well, what and what? Do you, are you mean in like since it began? Young since life? it began, yeah. Because um, I didn't yeah. know. Um, I don't know as much probably as a lot of people do. Um, I know it was start. It started in Texas by a guy named Jim Rayburn in 1941, um, and he started it because he felt like there needed to be something that was specifically catered to teenagers, um, a way to meet teenagers where they're at um, and love them regardless of their response to the gospel but love them exactly as they are and not necessarily as 
they should be or how they feel they it's you know people expect them to be and and from that he began just showing up at the school that he was like that's where the kids are so i'm gonna go there um so he started showing up at the school and then um he eventually started to meet like ha- and create events that happened during school like during club hours or whatever and that's kind of where the term young life club came from um and which is like our weekly meeting we do and um, that started in the school and then as it grew and people became interested in it and um, it just began to grow and grow and grow and um, it was really remarkable I mean you know it hasn't even been around for a hundred years and we're already in a hundred and uh 50 countries I think it is um across the world and um in every state and um so it's just I mean that's about as far as history goes that's a lot of what I know um as far well, as I was going to ask if he was still alive but I just I just googled it and he d- is not alive he is not no yeah, he uh, passed away in 1970 mm-hmm. we, yeah. we should uh maybe for one of y'all's activities y'all should do a a trivia game of the history of yeah (laughs) the history of young life uh jim rayburn like like do you know where he was born do you know where jim rayburn was born um i don't know twenty dollars i want to let me guess colorado marshalltown iowa iowa i did not know that yep there you go yeah and so he um it was originally known as young life campaign Mm -hmm. um that's um, okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna do a little more research because it's uh, really fascinating that he started this organization and it has grown, you know, to play such a significant part in the lives um, of so many um, people. So, so tell us a little bit about what you're doing today with Young Life. You've graduated, correct? Yes. So I graduated. Um, I graduated from UTM in 2019. Um, and I actually, so I wanted to be full time in Martin as soon as I graduated. But be, the one of the special things about Young Life that I love is that it's all locally supported. So if Young Life is to happen, it's because the community wants it to happen. Um, and so we just weren't there in Martin yet. So actually, I moved away for a couple of years, and um, and then I was able to come back and start fundraising um, in August of 2021. Does that sound right? 2021. Um, I think so. Um, and so basically what, what I do is, um, or what we do in Martin is we have young life, which is a high school outreach for Westview high school. Um, and so we build a group of, of leaders, a team of leaders who go in and, uh, meet kids where they are, build relationships with them. Um, uh, you know, go, go where they are at. Um, so we do that with the high school. And so we have weekly meetings that are called club, which is like our, we, you know, we get together and we hang out, we, you know, sing songs, do weird, crazy, fun games, um, and then share the gospel at the end of that. And um, we we do things called campaigners, which is named after the original word, Young Life Campaign. And that's that's like a small group. Um, it's kind of like a Bible study, but we refer to more of a as a Bible discovery because it's more about asking them questions and really using questions as the tool to, to kind of discover where their heart's at um, rather than just giving answers, but rather inviting them into bigger questions. And so, so we have each leader kind of has their own group of that. Uh, um, and then we also take them to camp, which is one of the, which is one of the most, I don't know, best thing. I wouldn't say it's the best thing that Young Off does, but um, they do it very well. Um, Young Off is, is very keen on doing things excellently. And so, so I help lead um, that Young Life ministry, and then we've also started up a middle school ministry as well. So it's the same thing, but specifically for middle schoolers. And so that's called Wildlife because, you know, middle schoolers can be uh, pretty wild. Um, and then we're also in the, in the works right now of creating a a similar, now college is different, but creating a similar outlet for and ministry for um, college kids at, at UTM. So. Um, that those are kind of the three main things that that I'm looking at right now. It's got on my plate, and so um, just kind of finding a way to healthy healthily establish um, those ministries to be able to sustain themselves in the long run. So, so you're a busy guy. Uh, I'm not as busy as it sounds. I think <laughs> um, it depends. So um, I did want to I did want to follow up here. 
you said uh, Colorado, right? When I asked where he was born, that's where he died. So Is it? You, you get half points for that. <laughs> I, I'll um, take it. He he died in Colorado Springs, Colorado, in on December eleventh, nineteen seventy. So there you go. Um, so it's uh, it's been really fun chatting with you. You and I have something in common that you probably have no idea about. I don't. So so uh, your wife, uh, who uh, your name's um, Goodman, right? And so your wife, who you married, her last name was Goodman, right? It is now. No. Oh, it wasn't before. Right. Right. Okay. Cut all that out. Um, Luke. <laughs> I, thought, I thought you said <laughs> no, his wife's name he was married that another before. Morgan, and now they're both Morgan Goodman. Oh. Okay. Let me. Let me. Oh, her name is Morgan. Yeah. Okay. So let me start that out. Let me start that over again. <laughs> So we have something in common. Um, your wife, your name is Morgan Goodman. And what is your wife's name? So her name now is Morgan Goodman. Yeah. See, there you go. My wife was Michelle Williams when we started dating. Yeah. And since I'm Scott Williams, when we got married, she's still Michelle Williams. So. Hey, I bet that she really appreciated the, because you don't have to change your name or anything then, did she? Well, she did not, and and but she was honestly excited about changing her name. She oh, she really? was not in love with the name William, so uh, mm. she was she was stuck with it though, um, at least as long <laughs> as I'm living. And then you know who knows after that, it's up to her. Right. Um, so, um, do you enjoy the area? Tell tell me a little bit about what you and the other Morgan Goodman. What do you do for fun around here? Well, uh, we do spend most of our time um, around Westview High School and doing what uh, going like, especially in the spring. A lot of our time is spent at sporting events. But um, we we really love. There's a couple things that we love in this area. Um, the as far as like places to eat, we love Blue Oak and Martin. Um, we also love we love just the way of life here. We um. I didn't say this before, but I moved to Orlando, uh, Florida, in between graduate and college and coming here. And, um, you know, I always thought the city life is was like a better life or whatever, more fun because there's all things going on. But but we have learned really quickly that small towns might not have the vast quantity of things, but we're convinced that these small towns, this area, West Tennessee specifically, uh, provides a much higher quality of life. Um, relationships are deeper. Um, life seems simpler. Things seem more intentional. Um, so we have really fallen in love with with just the intangible relationships that have been able to grow through through this kind of lifestyle in here. And um, lately, we've kind of been getting into a little bit of uh, a frisbee golf, um, which is something I'd never thought we would get into. So, but we're trying. <laughs> there's a lot of really nice courses um, for Martin Union City, Henry County. Huntington, uh, McKenzie, they're all over the place. And so we're, we're trying to travel around and, and play each course. And so that's, that's pretty fun. That's interesting. So there's a whole league. I don't know if there's a league or not. I'm, I mean, I'm still, I'm still pretty new, like Chase and, um, some other young off staff people in this area are really good a lot better than us. And, um, have been to a lot of these other places, but there's, there's some nice courses. I have thought that discovery park would be a fun place to play Frisbee golf. Discover Park would probably be one of the top places in the yeah. whole Northwest Tennessee area to play. Yeah, we need to look into that, don't we? <laughs> that we'll, get, be uh, we'll get you and Chase right on that. All right. Well, thank you so much for uh, spending time with us today. We really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate you guys. And thanks to all you listeners who joined Chase, Morgan, Alexis, Luke, and me today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com. And don't forget to bring your Frisbee.